So again, thank you for coming this evening. Tonight, it is um, a special night. This is the last um, big event for the Big Read for this year, which the book for the Big Read was Louise Erdrich's um, The Roundhouse. And I actually said it right this time. I keep saying The Birch House. That was the one for the teens. <laughs> Um, and so it is really exciting for us to be able to host um, Mark Denning here at Hedberg Public Library and to maybe give him a little bit of a different experience than he's had all week working with the kids at the school district. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mark Denning. <laughs> French English So um, that language is a language that was spoken in this particular area uh, not long ago when native folks were 100% of Janesville's population. And uh, I like to remind folks about that because we're still here. We're still here and we're doing programs, which is outstanding. And what's also outstanding is that you're here. It is, um, I can understand what it is to, to kind of move towards culture, to read about other cultures, and kind of feel unsafe about that. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that. And I'm going to be talking about how I introduced myself and why. Certainly, we're here to talk about the book, uh, which is a, 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 an interesting one to me. Um, so for the purposes and by way of introduction, that is, um, how do I say this? To all that is, to all that was, and to all that ever will be, like that greeting goes out to you. And there's also a personality in there, too. Wayne Bougieu is, and this is uh, very specific to the book because Louise Erdick hails from the culture that I am talking about right now. And it's like we have this really cool moment together where we can look into the beginning before the beginning of the book. Imagine if you had the great advantage of looking at something before it was even created. And that gives you an idea of how to look at the thing that was created to understand it in such a way that it's even a newer understanding that's based on older things. So it's pretty darn awesome. Wayne uh, is also a person. Wayne Bougieu, within the context of our culture, native culture in specific, Anishinaabe culture, the people, or the real people, or the human beings of the first human being. Uh, Wayne Obuju was this person that would go about the earth. He would do silly things. He would do uh, serious things. He would do goofy things. He would lie and cheat and steal. And at the very next moment, do really wonderful and amazing, honest things uh, as he moved about creation. So when we say this name, Wayne Obuju, it's, it's saying hello, but it's also the recognition of that spirit being that exists and resides in each and every one of us. And, and I think that is a, a good way to go about when you read indigenous literature. Because that literature comes from very real places. It comes from very honest places, even though on the book it says fiction. There's a lot of things in there that are not fictional. So in my opening, I'm asking you to hear the words that Louise Erdrich herself knows very well. Wayne Buju and Way Magana Duke, to all that is, to all that was, to all that ever will be. And in introducing myself, I'm giving you my name. And this name was given to me. I had another traditional name that was Menominee, and yet another one that is Oneida, reflecting my multicultural background. Uh, and also my English name, I have that too. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm talking about the name that came from the Three Fires Medewins. And understanding, too, that Medewin people have a great um, respect 
and actually Medewan means the way of the heart. It is the oldest continuous religion in Wisconsin. It is related also to Matawin, a Menominee religion. And all these things are going to have bearing on what we're going to talk about, so bear with me. Um, as Native people, we had our own way of looking at the world. As Native people, remembering that when I look out at you, in the way that I came up, in the way that I was raised, you all descend from me. You all descend from the places of our creation. You all come from the place and a sense of God that comes from our sense of God. So it is, it is kind of difficult to move through a book like this and not have that understanding, right? Because when we come to the book, we're coming with our stuff. We're coming with our ideas, and, and that's exactly right. And that's what the artistry and poetry and good writing can do, is to transport you out of yourself and into something else. But as you're being transported, remember that place that you're being transported with, and the device that's transporting you also has its own belonging, meaning, and purpose. Okay? So I kind of begin this talk, and I'm going to dedicate it to one of my friends. His name is Senator Murray Sinclair. He's from Canada. And he was a person that I think would really like this book. We haven't talked about it, but I think we're going to. Uh, Murray Sinclair, if you look it up on Grandfather Google, that's what we call Google in Native community. You want to know something, right? In, in Native community, a lot of times what we're encouraged to do is to put a, a same moth tobacco in our hands, left hand, heart line, right? And then to, to make that uh, erstwhile and heartfelt request for help or to give thanksgiving, whatever that may be. Um, so, so he is a, a Madei brother, a Madewan brother. And Murray Sinclair's job before he was a senator was that of a judge. And the country of Canada put Murray Sinclair in charge of something called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, uh, uh, Commission for First Nation people in Canada is a movement that very much parallels the Me Too movement that's happening in the United States. The Peace, Peace and Truth and Reconciliation Commission was, was compiled and asked for by the government and native people, native peoples of Canada, to come together to bring an understanding of who native people are today, how they function, what's happening, and what helps shape them. The Peace and Truth uh, Commission, Reconciliation Commission, really came down to something very important that it shares with folks here in the United States, and that is boarding schools. And boarding schools figures very heavily in this book, very heavily. Remembering that the author herself, Louise Erdick, is the child of two teachers from where did they teach? It was a boarding school, right? What happened at these boarding schools? Some of these boarding schools, they began in the, in the 1800s. We're talking about a little bit after 1850 where Native American children were either taken from a village, sometimes forcefully, sometimes voluntarily, both in the United States and Canada. And these children were put into schools like Tomo, Wisconsin, uh, like the one in Sisseton, uh, in the Wapiton area, where Louise Erdrich is from. And these children taken for their families were not, they were told to not speak language, to not participate in their culture, to not do any of those things, but to embrace dominant culture ways. And at these schools, they were trained into service positions, right? So this was kind of going on, and it got a really big ramp up in the, in the 1890s, and then moving in uh, towards uh, 1930. And those schools were existent up until the 1990s. Okay? So we'd like to think of this as something that was happening long ago, and it is not something that happened long ago. It's something that was happening now. So essentially what you had is children who were at boarding schools with their peers being taught by a limited number of adults who taught this school and conducted this school in a militaristic fashion. A lot of these schools were usually headed by um, people of Christian faith 
who, because the government either didn't want to or couldn't afford the teaching of American Indian children at the boarding schools, gave that responsibility to religious orders, like Lutherans, like Catholics, like um, different religions that are accepted out there in the world of America. So when in charge of these, you had usually one adult or maybe several adults being in charge of lots of children. And you can imagine what sorts of abuses were then made available to those adults who were running these schools with children. It is not unusual to find boarding schools that uh, many of them have their own graveyards, and some of them have mass graves for children. So when we're thinking about peace and reconciliation in commission in Canada, and my friend Judge Murray was put in charge of this commission, what they did is they went from one reserve to another, even along the border of North Dakota. North Dakota, certainly the state where Louise Erdick was born. And they would find parents that essentially were raised at the hands of folks that were one or two years older than them. But now they're parents in contemporary times. And so in those contemporary times, they really didn't know who they were. They didn't, meaning they didn't have a connection to being native. Their only connection to being native was, I know that I come from a place that's native. I look native. I have brown skin. But I don't know much about my culture. Certainly don't know my language. And I don't know my ways. So time and time again, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, as it toured Canada, going from one reserve to another reserve to another reserve, paralleled, uh, and it asked for testimony from people who were at these residential schools. That's what they're called in Canada. And at these residential schools, we would have people talking about boarding schools. And some of the very difficult circumstances young people were put into there was physical abuse, certainly. There was sexual abuse that was happening, sometimes even out in the open. Same thing was happening here in the United States. And during these truth and reconciliations, the commissioners that were in charge of this project, going from reserve to reserve to reserve, kept hearing uh, what became almost like a singular voice and a singular presence for Native people. And that was of a folks, uh, of us, of Native people that were struggling to regain themselves, to recover who they were, because they didn't know who they were. They were being taught to be something different, but in going to be a part of that something different, they were told they were Native. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that's, that's a really interesting part, is if you're trained to be something, and move away from another thing. And then when you go out to be that something, that world out there says, no, you're this over here. And that doesn't fit you. You're kind of somewhere in that quasi-middle. So um, the, what I'm going to do here in that long run-up is read something for Murray. And I would like that to be kind of a guide to when we're listening to our discussion tonight. So this is, um, at this particular moment, um, Justice um, Murray Sinclair, a Medewan person of the Three Fires Medewan. That's the center of that Medewan society is here in Wisconsin. Three Fires as it occurs to Janesville, which is really cool and why it's nice to be talking here. This was home to Anishinaabe people, Nishnebic or Potawatomi people. So certainly a part of that Medewan society kind of expanse that was and is our people. So this is Murray talking about his experiences. And he begins with, we at the commission are aware of the degree to which the intergenerational survivors, the current children and grandchildren of survivors, hunger for more than just knowing why. We know that they also hunger for a proper sense of self. They need to assist current and future generations of indigenous youth to find their place and purpose through cultural and language revitalizations is quite apparent. Indigenous children are more than the color of their skin. They are the products of their community, and they have the right to know what that community is. They have the right to know where they have come from, 
where they are going, why they are here, and who they are. The answers to such questions of life are not found in books. They are found in the experience of one's relationship with family and with friends and in the teachings of community to which you feel you belong. Uh, it's a long quote, but I hope you remember it because what he says in here is quite interesting for my talk and why I like using it. They have the right to know where they have come from, where they're going, why they're here, and who they are. The answers to such questions of life are not found in books. And so we're going to talk about a book. <laughs> we're going to talk about a book written by Louise Erdick, who is one of these children, who is a child of boarding school teachers, who is herself of mixed heritage, correct? Right, German, French, Anishinaabe. And she's not your average kind of person walking about the streets of Janesville. This is a person who went to Dartmouth, who was married to a Yale graduate who also uh, was teaching at Dartmouth, right? And this was a person who had some great writing skills when she was first starting and has, I believe, over, I think it's 14 books published. So this, what you're reading isn't someone who just kind of came in off the street. You know, this is a very highly educated woman. This is a person who knows what she wants to write and wants to communicate and someone who has a sense. And when you read her essays and her, her books especially, someone who's struggling with identity. It's an interesting struggle uh, to come across the who am I question and to vet that in public. And that is what's so interesting about this book. And um, how many people have not read the book in the audience, kind of looking around, a majority of people just coming in to hear the cliff notes of it. I appreciate that. I'm going to be depending on those of you who did read the book uh, to help me along here. So the book was written in the year 2012, right? I think Louise Erdick at that particular moment was um, 58, about 58 years old, to give you an idea of, of where it comes from. Now, remembering Louise Erdick's background, uh, growing up in a place called uh, Wapaton, North Dakota. Has anybody been through there? Very small little town, small community. Everybody kind of knows everybody. Everybody has each other's back. Very much like the community that you're seeing in the book, right? So Louise is writing about what she is uh, very knowledgeable about. So what's interesting about the reservation from which she hails her original place of origin is Turtle Mountain. The book that she wanted to write and the book that many of you read and we're talking about today was very much about justice. It was very much about justice. But it's interesting about how segregated that justice is. And I'm not talking about race. We're talking about physically to give you a sense of what this book is about, she, in some of her interviews, and, and when you read the book, you'll see it, is who has jurisdiction when something goes wrong? In a community like Janesville, we're very much, if someone comes into your home, trespass on your property, something happens to your car, you can call the police, you're fairly well certain they have jurisdiction. If it happens here in the library parking lot, they're going to ask you some questions, the who's, the what's, the why's, is this your car? Very basics, and they're going to go about, and they're going to look into your complaint. In Louise Erdrich's world that she grew up in, that world isn't that way. The world that she is writing about is a world that started kind of way back before even the United States was here. The world that she's writing about in the beginning before the beginning already existed before humans were here. And then when humans come here, here we are in this really wonderful world. And the world tells us who it is in this sense of wonderment and this sense of idea of being a part of something, not apart from it, but a true sense of communing, a true sense of belonging, a true sense of way of not as it's written in Genesis, where a person is created, it is a man, his name is Adam, and after he's created, he goes about the world naming things, 
And then he goes about the world and it's lonely, whatever happens, and a woman's created from him. The world of Louise Erdick is very different. It was the spirit that was here. And it was a spirit that resided over virtually all things. We come from a world where when we say to all that what is, to all that was, to all that ever will be, that includes not just the humans in this room. That isn't inclusive of the trees that are outside, the insects that are out there, those fish that are moving quite slowly, the birds that are very hungry right now. Please feed them. Suet is very good to let you know. Okay, a couple days more, we'll get them through, and it'll be better this week. So when Native people are kind of moving through this world and they're understanding this world, we are a part of it, not apart from it. So when it came to crimes, when it came to understanding the world through a lens where if someone's sense of self, if somebody's sense of safety and security is violated, the sense of justice was very different. The sense of settling that was very different than what it is today. An example would be the latest of Erdrich's book, and I would encourage you to kind of take a peek at it. And it's a book about a person who, and this informs, she usually has her books building one upon another. So for those of you that uh, read this book, it's kind of a, a preview of what, if you enjoyed this one, what's coming. And it does have a native justice that predates the Columbian Exchange, 1492. What we have in that book is someone who kills a child accidentally. And it, 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 they're just they're kind of trying to figure out what that means. And so what this person does is take their child and give that child to the family that that, the family that, that child killed. Right? The, the, I mean, understand. Sorry, I just misspoke. They took their own child and gave that child to the family and that family was the one that lost the child that he killed accident. They killed accidentally. In our justice, in the world we live in today, there would have been a police investigation. There would have been a who said what, when does it happen, all those kinds of things. We segregate this stuff. Then we go to a magistrate or a judge. And then usually we have somebody who is... Uh, you are responsible, you alone are responsible for that action as an individual. As an individual, you alone are responsible for that. It's not an us thing, a community thing, it's not any of that. It's you did that. And then at the conclusion of that, sometimes maybe the person's let off, depending on how much money they have or what position they have in our society to be truthful. And maybe someone's convicted of manslaughter. Maybe they do time, and maybe they do probation. But the world that Louise Erdrich and myself and some of you out in this audience descend from is not a world that had that kind of justice. We descend from a world where if you take the life of someone, then the life of someone in your family is forfeit. And it doesn't mean that that person is killed. It just means we're taking this life, and this life is going to be dedicated for the help of the family that's in mourning. That was our justice. That was our sense of things. It doesn't make it right. It just makes it different. So when we're approaching a book like the one we're talking about tonight, it's very interesting to see that the world that we lived in, which was inclusive and was all-encompassing, were people and, thing, and uh, trees and insects and fish and plants are all imbued with the power of life all empowered with, with, with soul, perhaps, another English word for it, even that's taking it apart, is that now that world with the Columbian Exchange became a world where there was sectionality, where when Benjamin Franklin developed this idea of property rights for our United States, where they would divide up land and squares, right, something he helped do for our United States and also for understanding property rights through the world. This section belongs to you, this section belongs to you, this section belongs to you. So it went with the law as well, towards humans. 
And so when we looked at this land, we saw it as ours. And if we were going to loan it or use it with somebody else, we understood if that land would pass from our use and pass to someone else's use, that wasn't generational. It was just to that person. It was for that moment in time. And it was a land base that we shared. So it was with justice, so it was with our land, so it was with our lives. After the Colombian exchange and when America came to be how America is today, that sectionality began to come. This is yours and this is mine, and that's this other person's, and then we have trespassing, all that other stuff. That thinking came to Louise Erdrich's reservation in 1898 through a thing called the Dawes Allotment Act. It's referenced a bit in the book, but not as precisely as she would have liked to. But this entire book, when she's talking about writing the book, she wanted to show about how justice works in her community, the community she was familiar with. So when we understand justice in this world, what happens? We have a question when something happens, and it usually isn't what happened. We kind of have an idea of what that is. One of those first questions out of our mouths is, who has jurisdiction? And sometimes in our minds, that's so already ingrained. We already know who has jurisdiction. We don't even have to ask. We just dial 911. And that person will come to your house. Somebody burglarized your house. And let's say it was the neighbor's boys or girls. And you even saw them do it. And you even have a tape of it in your house. Then you can tell the police, Janesville, this is what happened. These things are missing from my home. It's all on tape. And look, these young people are coming from this house. We can see their faces with our Google facial recognition things or whatever you're doing. And they're coming across the yard when I was busy doing whatever it might be. They come into my house, take my things. They go back into their house. And why, guess what? When I look inside the garage, I can see all of my things. I know they're in there because I can see them. And then the police will say, why? Let's check that out. So certainly they'll go by the garage. They'll ask some questions of the family. They'll take a peek. And if those things are in there, you know, it's kind of open and shut. Louise Erdrich's world that she's writing about and wanted to push through in this book isn't that world. The world that she's talking about and the justice she's talking about is one that was brought to us through that Colombian exchange. And that is a world of sectionality. That sectionality is such that, and this is what happened with my uncle Alan Caldwell. Alan Caldwell, Menominee guy, lives on a reservation. And during the Dawes Allotment Act, what happened was after rounding up Native people, United States government, on reservations now, a lot of times not even allowed to leave that reservation, then the United States wanted more. And the United States says, you know what? We're going to do you guys a favor. You ever have the government come to your house and say they're going to do good things for you? Today's that day, right? Tax day. All those good things. You get an extra day to pay money today. Maybe you want to get a little extra juice. They've been so good to you, right? Why, I'm not going to give you that much. I'll give you even more. You've been so good to me this year. How many have done that? <laughs> Sectionality, right? There's mine. Where's the hours part? Some uncle's at home, notices his TV's missing, got it on camera, like our camera over there. Neighbors from across the way came over, took his TV, and you can see it in the garage. 911, police come to the house. Mr. Caldwell, what's your issue? Missing my beautiful TV. I know where it is. Hey, well, what's the address? Write it down. Oh, we can't do that. We, we can't go next door because we're tribal police. That little section of property is actually Shano County. And we don't have any jurisdiction in Shano County. So we can't go over there. You're going to have to call Shano County. 911 again. Shano County. Oh, Mr. Caldwell can't come over. Because you're on reservation land. We're going to have to take your statement over here in Shano County. Well, can I stand in my neighbor's driveway? 
Nope, that's the property. The one to say this. So, what happened in this book, and those of you dedicated readers out there, this, there, this is about jurisdiction. The Dawes Allotment Act in 1898, also called the Severalty Sever Act, it's known by two other names, uh, was such that the United States government came in, if you're all native folks in the room, and said, we're going to give you so many acres, that's going to belong to you now, instead of having this land base in common actually owned by the United States, but you have say over what that land is. You can, instead of having that, let's make you individual landowners. So you'll get a piece of land, you'll get a piece of land, and anything left over, we'll, we'll sell that off. That'll be extra. So this is what happened in Wisconsin in Menominee. They're in Legend Lake, if anybody's been in the Shano area and know Legend Lake, right? Most of the landowners in uh, Menominee County on the lake side are who? Those folks who got the lands when that sectionality came to Menominee Reservation, when that reservation was terminated. That is what Louise Erdick, that is at the bottom of this book. She wanted to talk about the scales of justice and how justice is either done or not done in this world and how it's done differently for different people. And when you're reading this book, it becomes to be very clear. Because for those of you not familiar with the book, this book is very much about a moment that we're sharing in the Me Too movement. This is a PG, a hard PG-13 talk now. This is a, a kind of light to medium R rating. In this book, there is rape. In this book, there is killing. There is accidental and purposeful death, and there is hope and hopelessness. All of that in very magnified ways. But how does society deal with it? So what we have is that this is you, and this is me, and that's how it is. This is a world and a life that Native people really didn't know that much about. And so here's an idea. When a capital crime like rape to the degree that's depicted in the book happens, money is stolen to such a degree, or there's murder on most reservations in the state of Wisconsin around the United States, that's where the Federal Bureau of Investigation comes in. Because it's a capital crime, because reservations are federal land, and they're responsible for the investigation. So think about the world that Louise Erdick is writing in. How many FBI people live in North Dakota? When was the last time you heard of James Comey headed in North Dakota with hundreds upon hundreds of investigators to be put to bear onto crimes on the reservation? One of the, the things that Louise Erdick quotes, and I don't want to mess this up because this is being taped and I want to be careful about what I'm saying. I don't want to ballpark things. But in part of what she's writing about this book isn't just about sectionality, but she's also talking about what happens when young Indian women, older Indian women, middle-aged women get raped on the reservation. I'm not look at the notes, but they're in here. It's just her numbers are that 80% of the rapes of Native American women that happen on reservations are done by non-Native people. And of those, a majority of those, in fact, every single one of them are not investigated, nor does the tribal police have any jurisdiction over those cases. If it's a native male or female that does it, they have jurisdiction. But if it's a non-native person, there's no jurisdiction. Do you remember in the book how she's describing this? So what we have in the book is a character who does rape, attempted murder, and the thing is, well, this happened away from a jurisdiction. So then who has jurisdiction? So there's fight over who, who has say over what this, who can investigate it? But the important part of Erdrich's book is going back to the beginning before the beginning. This rape and attempted murder happened where? The title of the book is what? The Roundhouse. And what is a roundhouse? In Louise Erdick's culture, 
Anishinaabe culture. The roundhouse is a sacred place. The roundhouse can have lots of meanings. Remember, I'm using English for this stuff. The roundhouse can be about this big. It can be a, a place where people, young people, sometimes uh, even myself, will go out and fast for a day. You can fast for a day. And we're not doing it because we're on a diet or we want to cleanse. Okay? The reason why we're fasting in those little roundhouses is because we want a place that's quiet. We want a place to meditate, to have that mindfulness that you've been learning about, which I'm so happy for your culture right now. <laughs> because you're discovering mindfulness. You want to ask us about it, we'll be happy to tell you whatever you want to know. But I love that part. But these little roundhouses that a young guy like you can be in, and a young guy like you can, can, can fast, is that the idea is that in that little roundhouse, you can contemplate, you can be mindful, you can think about things, you can kind of actually kind of move away from those demands of cell phones, of even uh, food and water itself, and you begin to place yourself and begin to approximate the presence of God. Even in Christianity, where does God sit? There's no any specific place. That's why sectionality surprises me in Christian circles. How did that come about? What property is God's? It's all. So to me, Benjamin Franklin's God was very much, I think, a native guy because he didn't have any property. This was just existence, and God was a part of it. It's amazing how really kind of commonality, common things we have instead of this sectionality. So let's say you're in that little roundhouse. You're in that place of quiet and darkness at night. Then we'll have adults check on a person. So that can be a roundhouse. A roundhouse can also be a little bit bigger We'll call them sweat lodges. So many numbers of poles. The door faces one way for one culture. In North Dakota, it's really fun to go over to where Louise Erdrich is from, their little roundhouse areas. You go to a Lakota sweat, their doorway is facing one way. And you go to an Anishinaabe sweat, and their doorway is facing the exact opposite way. Right? And the songs are very different. Right? And in one of those roundhouses, they really like the sweat. They like it super hot. Let's heat that up, you know, let's just get that going as much as any other one. It's more uh, about what the words are within that roundhouse. And however hot it gets, that's how hot it gets. If it gets super, that, that's how it is. If it stays warm, that's how it is. So very different kinds of approaches to those roundhouses. There's also larger roundhouses, like here in Wisconsin, Lac de Flambeau, a roundhouse which is maybe, probably it kind of in a circular way, about as round as this room. And you can go in this room and you can rent it or you can borrow it from the tribe. And you can have namings in there. You can have feasts in there. You can have somebody, maybe somebody along the way, ancestrally lost their clan. So they're giving tobacco. And within this roundhouse, these things can be brought to them through a messenger and from the spirit. So these roundhouses are very sacred places. So understanding this kind of cosmology, if not metaphysics, if we bring this to the book of the roundhouse, the title itself begins the division between our people. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when you see the title roundhouse, and, I, and this isn't about right and wrong, and who knows more and who knows less. It's just about being. And if I was not native and born in the culture that I was or familiar with those little houses to the bigger ones, and I saw the term roundhouse, I would just think roundhouse. It's round, and it's a house, and there's lots of people in there. Or maybe one, but it just kind of that's what occurs to me, right? So when you approach the book, it's, it's quite innocent. And you're like, wow, I like Louise Erdrich's very choral sort of representations when she presents her books, right? Her earlier books like The Beat Queen and all those other, there's lots of voices, lots of little stories. Her books, actually, I think the approach to Lise Erdrich reading is, is to think about like the Canterbury Tales, to be a little bit more classic about it, where lots of characters have lots of voices. 
Okay, so if you approach Louise Erdick, her writing becomes more approachable if you think of it in those terms. Little vignettes that create a larger vignette. And this book busts that wide open, right? Louise Erdick's writing is in a singular voice. And it is in the voice of an older person who's looking back on his life. Okay, and it is a singular voice throughout, fairly much throughout the book, except for some of the soliloquies, the, um, the stated pieces by individual characters. But when we look at the roundhouse, even when we look at the title, the sectionality between our people begins before we even get to the first paragraph. Somebody who's approaching that book and just sees roundhouse, oh, it must be a roundhouse. And as you get deeper into the book, you begin to understand this is a very sacred place. And within this sacred place, one of the most violent acts and vile acts that can be thought of was done to the main character's mother. And sexual assault was it. Gas was poured on her. Uh, attempted murder, right? And this was in the place of this sacred place. If I would kind of make a, a, an equivalency, which of course is almost always wrong, and in this case I know it is wrong, but I'm trying to get to people understand. Imagine if a capital crime would be done in your churches. The horror that would go through your communities. The, how the newspapers, how the police would respond, how all of people would kind of come together and rally around. And there's a huge but in this, and that is gender. We're talking about a woman who was raped. We're talking about a woman that was virtually killed, certainly beaten. And there's a generational presence in this audience who remembers a time when we didn't talk about that stuff in polite company. And we didn't talk about that stuff even within our own families. We didn't talk about child abusers in our families. What we would do is say things like, well, don't go by uncle so-and-so. And when your children are in and around those, earth, those celebrations of family, you wouldn't say this is an abuser. We know this, been convicted, or whatever. We, we, just, we wouldn't say anything. We just don't go by them. And if they're going by them, playing with them, then there's usually an adult watching very closely, but nothing is ever said. Imagine this in this book. A crime of such tragedy that raises to the height that it raises to, and it's just like, it's what happens in our community. It's tragic for the family, but it happens. A community that's in poverty, and it was life-shaping and life ending for a few of the characters in the book. So I think, um, does someone have the book? Yes, that's okay. Oh, okay, got it. So this is what we're gonna do. We are gonna do this in a very Islamic Muslim moment because I wanna celebrate a little diversity now and break you out of some of this native thinking. Uh, anybody know how to read the Quran properly? How do we do that? Okay. Should this be the Bible? Here we go. Okay, start there. Quran. Yeah, go like that. Other way. That's what we're going to do with our book for our good friends that haven't read the book. We are going to go backwards. We're going to go backwards to the most brilliant part of this book, and you're going to help me with it. And our cameraman is making sure that I am going to repeat some of the things that are being said because they can't hear it from our friends at home. So going to the back of the book, for those of you that read it, going to kind of volunteer in sections, maybe kind of divide it into thirds. Uh, let's begin out there, all right? Those of you that read the book, what happens at the end of the book? Let's spoil it for everybody that might want to read it. Because this book is amazing enough that you can know the name of, the, of it. Like, think about it like this, Titanic. Did you ever see the movie? Okay, why? <laughs> you, you know how it ends. So why are you watching the movie over and over again and going like this when you go on your boats and ships and stuff? There's a story there. So knowing the ending doesn't matter because the story is amazing. 
So don't worry about it. So let's start at the back of the book. All right, throwing it out there. Back of the book, what do we got? Go ahead, say that a little louder. Everyone's become older in the book, yes. So we go kind of working backwards just to foreshadow. We have people, the main character at the particular beginning of the book is about how old? Right, adolescence, right on. Yep, and, and at the end of the book, he's about 55, right on. Yes, about my age, great, very good. Okay, all right, moving from there, that we know that this is a remembrance piece, part of the narrative, what else? Kepi dies in a car accident after he and Cho killed his mother's uh, sailor. Right. So folks that didn't hear that understand that the main character, and it's not really kind of a best friend, it's a, a best friend, right, buddies, pals, and childhood friends. They, th that, they get in a car accident. Again, repeating for the camera. Sorry, not trying to treat you like children. Uh, but for the camera, they are in a car accident with his best friend. And uh, this person, is his best friend is killed in this car accident. Yes, he survives it. But it kind of triggers lots of things. So kind of, and then before that, before that car accident. So looking in the kind of towards the middle section of the book, his best friend and he had set out to kill the assailant of the mother. The person who was raped in this very sacred place was this young man who is now an older man in a book. It was his mom who was attempted uh, murder and attempted rape. And what had happened as they're remembering is the son went out to seek his own justice in the way that he saw his way of doing justice at 13 years old. So for capital crime at 13 years old, lots of you may remember being 13. You don't remember that yet because you're not 13. But when you're 13 years old, is your world made of, of the future and what's going to happen two weeks from now or is it made up with right now? It's made up of right now. So when this young man at 13 years old begins co to be cognizant of what happened with his mom, his world of justice demands what? Revenge. And it has to be now. He is, he is coming from an intact family. His mother and father together. So that's an unusual piece for our reservations, for a mom and, and son. And, and his dad is a professional. What is his dad's profession? Tribal judge, right? So this is not any guy. This is a guy with a lot of education. That, that lots of education kind of mirrors the author, right? So when you're looking at books, it's really fun, especially with Louise Erdrich, to see all these different personality pieces coming up of her in all of these characters, never in full. But if you look at the entirety of the book, you can see her in full. That's another way to look at it. So his dad's a judge. How does his dad see justice in the midst of this book? How does his dad see justice? Does he want, an immediate, does he want it to be immediate? He wants it to stick. And he wants it to be done the right way, meaning using the court systems, existing laws. He wants the message to be out there in the community that this isn't OK. Turns out, as we're looking at our book, that the assailant is native or non-native? Non-native. And the victim, his mom, was native. Herein lies that sectionality. The crime happened at the roundhouse. The mom was native. The guy who did it, non-native. Why is that important to our book? Jurisdiction. The tribe can't do anything about it because he's not a member of the tribe. Can you imagine if this happened to maybe someone in your family, daughter, mother, sister, wife? Call up the Janesville Police Department. The police Department shows up. And then they say, can't do anything. And what happens if you present evidence? Can't do anything. And what if you're 13 watching this? 
even more immediate, right? Remembering when you're 13? Remember when you've fallen in love when you're 13? There ain't like a bunch of loves. There's only one. And that's that like girl who's in 11th grade or whatever it is. I don't know. However you guys do it or, or that guy in 15th grade. I don't know. But it's just they haven't discovered you yet, right? You're looking at So it's immediate. It's immediate. And the emotional piece that comes when you're 13, that even two weeks from now is too long. And to feel that particular moment in a boy. Louise Erdrich wrote that she could have done any character, but she wanted it to be a boy. She wanted it to be a boy who's 13 and who's beginning his wonderment about adulthood, who's moving from that childhood, and who also doesn't have the restrictions of gender. She says this in her own writings. She says it in her own book. And you can see it in the writing. How different would this book be if it was a girl? The place of a girl when they're growing up at 13 is, well, let's get along. Why don't you be friends? Let's figure a way out and through things. For a boy who's growing up at that age, walking through a hallway is quite a puzzle. If you're walking through a hallway at school, the thought in a boy's mind as he's walking through the school is, and he sees a guy he doesn't know, it's more like, can I take him? Am I wrong about this? Can he take me, right? What's a girl say? I wonder if she'll be my friend. Those are very different questions. Louise Erdick was very, very specific about choosing the gender because she wanted to feel, in the moment of writing this book, what it would be to be a boy at 13 and have that much freedom in the world. Because she, as a girl and a woman, has never felt that. So in a, writing this character in the way she did, she wrote a character that could really be in the moment and feel free to be in the moment and feel free if he wants to move towards something that he can do that without encumberment. That is why she chose to write the character she did. Right? That is some deep stuff, I'm telling you right now. And as a tribal person, that 13-year-old is also unencumbered by sectionality. He doesn't see jurisdictions. He doesn't see property rights. He doesn't see that that land's reservation, and that's not reservation. This person's subject to our laws, and this person isn't. He's so free and in wonder of the world that he just knows justice has to be done. And his idea of justice is immediate, his idea of justice is killing this person. And so he and his best friend go about setting this up. He and his friend are about the same age. So what happens when they set up their revenge scene, readers? What happens in that scene? He and his best friend, uh, one lays in wait, who lays in wait? The boy, the son. Right. Right, and he doesn't know his best friend's kind of hanging. His best friend's doing what best friends do. Watch, watching his back. Do you ever have any friends like that in the house? Anybody got it? If you don't have a friend, get a friend like that. <laughs> Not a guy that's going to commit murder, okay? But you know, you hear what I'm saying. Maybe a little short of that. <laughs> you want somebody who's going to watch your back. This is true friendship, truly felt that both boys would go outside of each other for each other, and one doesn't even know it. Oh, my God. That is, this is a deep book. And if you're not crying when you're hitting some of these sections, man, you, you're, you are now, because you're beginning to see it. So this young boy whose mother was raped, gasoline was poured on her, was to be set fire. He lays in wait with a gun. And what happens? What does he do with this gun? Readers? Hits him a couple times, but it's not fatal. Yeah, he's not a good shot. Right, and his best friend knows it. You know who your friends are, right? You know what they're capable of, what they're not. And can you imagine being a 13-year-old boy behind a gun? I don't care if you kill deer or squirrels or fish or do whatever. 
Human, that's something different. To me, I make this equivalency, and I will do that, of when you go hunting bear with your relatives, and that moment when you take the skin off, and you see the bear without the skin, what's he look like? He looks human, man. He looks human. He has shoulders. He has a neck. And when you take that off, when I was a kid, when you take that off, it's like, oh, I did that. For Menominee people, the bear was the first person in the earth who became a person. Now, when you grow up with that story like I did when a young guy like you up here, I grew up with that story, got the bear, kind of mid-sized, I can't say it was champion-sized bear, nothing like this, a bear, you know, go, good job. Take the skin off. It's emotional. And at 13, which is about the age I was, I, I never hunted a bear again. Skinned a couple, but I, I never did it again. That's how emotionally I was. But for a guy who isn't a good shot, it's understandable that he missed. And imagine that moment, that moment of him like, what did I do? How'd this go, that little moment? that, that kind of hangs in eternity for a 13-year-old. And then all of a sudden, as you said, his best friend appears out of nowhere. And what's his best friend do? Caps him, right? That's young people call it. Cap him. I don't think she calls it that in the book. But sees him do that. Can you imagine that horror first and then that next one? That one your best friend did that? An amazing piece, it's an amazing piece section of the book. And so before that, what happens? So we know how the murderer was, how the rapist was dealt with. He was a misogynist, he was a racist. So we know how he was dealt with. So what happened before he was dealt with like that? Right. Right. So as we're moving backwards to the front of the book, this person who had done this to this woman is moving through the community and, like you said, brazen because he knows the law can't touch me. And that is the one thing culturally that I find so interesting about dominant culture people is that you can do lots of things, but what's so offensive to a dominant culture person is to call them a liar. And the second thing is to say that what they're doing is against the law, right? So if you say that's against the law, all of a sudden people's backs get up and it's like, what do you mean? That's your property, that's my property, that's the law, and well, they're gonna look it up. That's how important it is. It's pages in a book. To native people, we're like, it's made up. It's an artificial construction. Article two, section 14, letter B, under that section, Roman numeral V1, period, we're just like, it's wrong, you know, that is, but for the law, there it is, right, okay, and if it does, it's not in there, we're good, sectionality, there is a, for me, and I have not seen this interview, but for me as a native person, this entire book is an editorial of our cultures, both hers and ours. This guy, untethered by the law, the 13-year-old. The other guy, untethered by the law, different ages. And by, different, by untethered by the law means this person who did this crime, everybody in the community knows it. This person is walking around in the community acting like, you may know what I did. I know what I did. And there is nothing you can do about it. That what he did is okay. That within himself, that it's so justified, that it's manifest in him that he has this power. Right? We have a word for that in our history lectures at the university. It's called manifest destiny. There's a guy named Andrew Jackson who, and I will make this analogy about feeling manifest, feeling sort of above the law. When Andrew Jackson ran for president, he was running against what, the, what he thought was an aging population of rich people who owned land, 
who they, he would criticize them and say, this America belonged to new people, rich people shouldn't have it. He kind of started some sorts of economic divisions within the country. He was an every man's every man, and he was the disruptor. He's going to bust it all up when he becomes president. Everybody loved him for it. They elected him for it, and he did exactly that when he was president. And when it came to his attention that the Cherokee people who looked at the law, applied the law, and in that law said, we have a reservation, we signed a treaty with the United States, and that reservation is certainly ours. And the Supreme Court found in our favor against the United States, and the United States can't come in here and tell us to move and forcibly be removed. What was Jackson's answer? Let the, the Let the Supreme Court enforce the law. Andrew Jackson was moving about, and the law didn't apply to him. And everybody knew it, and it didn't matter. Manifest. It is manifest in him that he was above the law. And so we ordered the removal of the Cherokee people, resulting in the deaths of thousands of Cherokee people on the forest march. That larger scale picture is what is in this book. We have a version of that Andrew Jackson walking about the reservation, the little hamlets. People know who he is, they know who he's about. They, within themselves, have a sense of justice. For Native people, while not in a book, there is a sense of justice for us, and that is what we're doing in this life that that will come back to us. And if it doesn't come back to us directly, it could come back on the people we love. So that's why an insider view is that if this would happen in my community and someone was walking around like this, being older, I would feel like the father in the book, that their justice, a system should be done with this person. There is a way to deal with it. But in the meantime, in my mind, in my cosmology, in my faith and belief, that what he has done in this world, that there is a price for that. I'm not the one who has to go out and do it. But I'm also not 13 years old. So this person's walking around. People are looking at him, watching him, feeling what they're feeling, unsafe, feeling mad, feeling despondent, adding to depression. Because certainly when it comes to the reservation, this guy is not the first guy that got away with this kind of thing. Imagine this, not too far away from here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, American Indian students are going to school every day. 63% of the American Indian women on that campus have been sexually assaulted. So for us to think that this doesn't happen in our world today, or that people are not brought to justice today, this book, while a piece of fiction, is reality in daily native life. Hit grandfather Google, 63% sexual assault, American Indian women, you'll see the news article pop right up. How many people convicted of it? They didn't have that in the article, but they were looking for any active cases. So when we look at this book, this isn't just a book of fiction as a native person. This is a book of fact, and this is a book of testimony. It's very powerful for us as native people. And what I don't want to create in this room is a sense of us and them, or right and wrong. It's just different ways of being, understanding this kind of thing and trying to figure out a way forward. So working our way backwards. So we have the end of the book where this is an older man who's remembering. We have another section of the book where he's remembering his friend and all went down and how the conclusion of the character who had did such uh, bad acts to his mother. We have that section in the book where, where he is personally, where his dad is, wanting to believe in a system so bad but the system is failing. So we're in that. What is the relationship between the father and son readers? Antagonistic, yep. And, and how's the son feel about his mom? Frustrated. 
frustrated, worried. Okay. Right. It's very interesting in life, right? When we get older, when we're younger, it's kind of all in front of you. Now a lot of you in this audience are old enough to have friends that have passed away. You've had friends or acquaintances that have committed suicide. You've had friends and acquaintances where crimes have been committed against them. It could be that you're at an age where a majority of your friends have passed away. And life is never the same. But imagine being 13 when you're thinking the whole life is in front of you, and now you have to live like you're 60 years old. Denial becomes a part of it. Pushing back against anybody who loves you. Has anybody in the room ever, and I don't, I'm not looking for a show of hands, but you understand? In a moment of crisis and depression and despondency, you pushed away everything that loves you. Even the very thing that you love, and now that thing that you love is pushing you away. That is an incredible piece of writing that is in this book. I would encourage you to, to read that section, but to understand this is a very good metamorphosis of a young man who's reaching adulthood in a very different path, but in a path that is familiar to most Native American people. So to kind of put a point on it, our average age, our lifespan, when I was a child in sixth grade, I would look at the um, statistics that would come out of the Census Department. Average lifespan of American Indian folks is 54 years old. Okay. Now at my age, now I'm 56, no longer this young guy's age, and now we've moved up quite a bit. We're up into the 60s. Right? What is it for dominant culture? Moving in the 70s, right? We'll catch up to you guys yet. We'll catch up to you guys yet. But why is the number so low? It's not because we have um, health disparities. We do have them. I mean, if you really think about it, they're really there. At the age of 48, we, on average, we have the health disparities of a 72-year-old. Diabetes, heart disease, obesity, those kinds of challenges. Those, those, those things are there. Those are real. But we, we can survive as long as anybody else. But the reason why our statistic for survivability or mortality is so low is because so many of us die so young. This is the world that she's writing about. This is a world where when Oneida Tribal Social Services in Milwaukee just about seven years ago wanted to get involved with, um, there's a, a movement and they use pink as a lot of, what is the name of that when they do these races? It's the uh, Susan Coleman, right? And they do beautiful work, right? Lots of education. If a woman can't find a place to get an exam, they'll get an exam, right? When we called the Susan B. Coleman Institute to get involved in their community education program, to get involved in their run as a team, the answer from the Susan B. Coleman representative in Milwaukee was that, uh, and what we wanted to do in specific was bring in the Harley Davidson that they were going to give away at the Susan uh, G. Coleman run in Milwaukee. They had a Harley Davidson to give away. We wanted that pink motorcycle at one of our fundraiser events at Potawatomi. A lot of money, a lot of people. So we're like, oh, we'd love to have that bike. Answer comes back in writing. We looked at your cancer statistics, and, and there's not a lot of cancer onset in your, in, in your community. So we're giving that bike to another community that has more need. OK? So I write back. Our cancer mortality rate is higher than any other group in the United States. What's happening is our women aren't being diagnosed because they don't have access to get diagnosed. And so when you tell me that your statistics are saying that we can't use your bike as an awareness vehicle for our women, because we're not showing up in that statistic. We're showing up in the statistic that we're dead. You understand what I'm saying? So when we're looking at this book, this isn't just a piece of historical writing. This is a piece of what's happening now in lots of different shapes and forms throughout our community. So when you're looking at this work of fiction, there are lots of other little stories that can come in here. Healthcare, how are women looking at? What about healthcare? It's all in there. So let's going back to the book. Now we have this guy, his father. They're a little bit at odds. His, he had his mother before, which is so powerful and his mother after. A lot of you have moms like that. A lot of you got dads like that. 
So the mother before was loving. The mother before had routines. The mother before checking in on them. And now at 13, what an interesting time. Isn't that the age when we're trying to figure out how to express our love for people who are older than us, especially our parents? Like, remember when you turned 13, 14, you're trying to figure out how to hug your dad? Remember he used to hug you, or maybe he never hugged you. And you're like, well, that's how you are, man. I'll go hug someone. I'll go hug this one over here. I'll go hug mom. But then all of a sudden, you go hugging mom at 13, you're just kind of like, how do I do that? <laughs> you right? Do you remember those moments? This guy's at a moment where he's beginning to separate from his parents. But at that particular developmental moment in his life, where he's beginning that, that place of separation from parents and trying to figure out to be his own guy, all of a sudden, he's magnetically transformed into wanting to belong to his mom again. Is that healthy making for him? It's not healthy making for him on so many levels. Because on one level, you would think, oh, he has the mom that he had before. And through their natural process, he would start pushing back against her authority, right? Son, I want you home at 10 o'clock. Son, an eight-year-old, like, well, I'll be home at nine, man. I'm hanging out with you all day. 13 years old, drop me off around the corner. I don't want anybody to see me with you in this car. Right? Anybody have kids like that? That's the age of this kid. This is the age when he should be separating from his mom. Do you see what I'm saying? And on this scale, now he's drawn to her even stronger, even affecting his mind more. At a place when he should be separating with her, now he's drawn to her, and it's like, man, it's messing the kid up. It's messing his life up. The victim that happened at that sacred ground wasn't just the mom, as they say in every crime. The victims aren't the ones normally that you see. The victims are the ones that are all around. And he's one of those. Paid for it through his life. So his mom before, his mom after. And what happened before that? Right. So what Louise Erdick does is driving the, the character in this book is to driving that character towards self-actualization in their culture. So when we're talking about clan animals, it's not like, well, that's really cute. Scottish people wear clan skirts. Big thing about that, no underwear, underwear, big mystery, never know. You know who knows? Got to go to another book reading for that one. But when we talk about clan animals for native people, a lot of people say, man, that's cute. But for me, my clan, the May, Sturgeon. So my family goes back before person kind was created. My family goes back to the dinosaurs. My family goes back to the beginning before the beginning. When the very first thing, even before the first thing, was awareness. So my family and my clan, when we trace our step back and going forward, we see that the sun shining the way it does. We understand through our teachings that the sun shines the way it does inside of the earth. You guys are catching up with us. You guys are catching up with us. Like it. Where's water come from? Origin of water. Was it here on this iron ball when it was going around the sun? Or did it come from the stars? Water comes from the stars. On Anishinaabe people, water is what? Lowered from the sky. Right? Those teachings go with our clans. So these things that we look at as, oh, he's going to bond with his clan animal? That's not like a guy, oh, I'm going I'm to go hug a, a skunk now. <laughs> that skunk's my helper. Now I'm going to go hug that guy. Hug it out. Skunk's got a lot of teachings in it. Special forces, man. <laughs> Telling you, you know, this is got a got an indigenous guy right here, old young days, guys wearing skunk hats. Those are our special forces guys. Why? If we want to bond, understand teaching what a skunk has to do, imagine being a young guy. Now you gotta be so quiet, so quick, 
and forceful and intentional with your actions. You actually got to get up on the skunk. You got to get up on that little brother. You got to pin his tail down on the ground and then get his head at the same time so he doesn't spray you. Now, if you can't do that at the same time, I don't care what happens. You're going to get sprayed. <laughs> so now when you're wearing those skunk armbands and skunk leggings but around the, up below the knees for dancing, or you get that skunk head on, that's the same as you guys when you talk about Navy SEALs and Green Berets. That's ninja people out there, man. When you go to a powwow, a lot of kids look at that skunk hides and they're like, oh, why would someone wear that? And we look at it and we're like, man, I don't know if I could wear that. You know what? I, I don't. Purposely, I don't. Because I, I haven't earned that. I'm not and never was at that level of warriorness. I wouldn't even think about it. But that's the guy's helper. That shows the guy's station in life. So what I'm trying to say is when you talk about this idea of him reaching out to that clan animal, trying to learn about where he comes from, which helps inform who he is. Remember those words from my, my friend, the judge? And now we're coming towards the end of my remarks tonight. When I began, and uh, Murray Sinclair, now senator, talked about every child deserves to know who they are, where they come from, where they're going, what they're about. That's what it's in this book, too. He's reaching out into his culture. It's not just a cute thing to say, I'm looking for my clan. I'm looking for that helper, that animal that's going to do it. It's very real, very real. Now, kind of moving past his search in identity and where he's going to find it in his culture, it kind of makes sense that he would look in that direction. But again, it's kind of questionable. Why would he look for identity when the role model's in front of him? The role model where someone can be above the law and walk through his community and not be ashamed and just be whoever he wants to be, whenever he wants to be. That's in front of him. Did dirt to his mom. Horrible stuff. That guy's walking around. But yet this kid chooses to look at Native culture. Why would that be? Well, there's that ghost. Tell us about the ghost. Good. Now we're there. <laughs> Tell us about the ghost. So he sees a ghost that follows him around, and what does that ghost mean or tell him? That's what he wants to know. He wants to know if it's somebody that's dead or if it's somebody with a message. Right. So we've got a 13-year-old walking around with an imaginary friend. <laughs> so what are you going to do with the 13 year old little kid in junior high school that's walking around with an imaginary friend? Sometimes I see someone, sometimes I don't. Where are they going to go? Nurse's office. <laughs> what's, what's happening with you? You... You can go to the office now. We're going to have a parent-teacher conference, <laughs> right? But yet he's choosing that life because that life has power, because for him it has resonance, because for him it's, not un it's unusual, but it's kind of not unexpected because you're going to want to wonder and be curious about it and not right away want to go to the doctor and figure out what's wrong with yourself. And so now in talking about all the book, this book kind of working our way backwards to the front, there's two sections of the book that really speak to me. One is where the dad kind of has his say. And it's a, kind of a more of a, a very truthful piece of what this dad is and who the dad is and why he is. And it's a very awesome section. The most awesome section, though, is like any good writer, you can substitute the beginning of that book for the end of the book, and you wouldn't lose anything. So in listening to this section, and I'm going to do a reading, and it just goes on for about a paragraph. Be thinking about that 13-year-old. Be thinking about the dad and the mom. Be thinking about what their life looked like beforehand. But yet, something's coming. Change is coming. Chapter 1, 1988. Small trees had attacked my parents' house at the foundation. They were just seedlings with one or two rigid, healthy leaves. Nevertheless, the stocky shoots had managed to squeeze through knife cracks in the decorative brown shingles covering the cement blocks. They had grown into the unseen wall, and it was difficult to pry them loose. 
My father wiped his palm across his forehead and damned their toughness. I was using a rusted old dandelion fork with a splintered handle. He wielded a long, slim, iron fireplace poker that was probably doing more harm than good. As my father prodded away blindly at the places where he sensed roots might have penetrated, he was surely making convenient holes in the mortar for next year's seedlings. Whenever I succeeded in working loose a tiny tree, I placed it like a trophy beside me on the narrow sidewalk that surrounded the house. There were ash shoots, elm, maple, box elder, even good-sized good catalpa, which my father placed in an ice cream bucket and watered, thinking that he might find a place to replant it. I thought it was a wonder the treelets had persisted through a North Dakota winter. They'd had water, perhaps, but only feeble light and a few crumbs of earth. Yet each seed had managed to sink the hasp of a root deep and a probing tendril outward. There is nothing for me to say when you have a writer like that. You could have easily put that at the end of the book. The message is resiliency. For all of what he had been through, for all of the plants that his dad and so on, his generation poking and prodding, but yet creating roots in his behavior for things that were going to undo the very things they were doing. But yet at the end of the day, there's resiliency. Even after all of what he's been through at the age he was been through. That is why when I told you, you may know the story of the Titanic, but you still go to the movie and you'll watch it again because it's that kind of movie and it's that kind of story. That is this book. You got a chance. You know a little bit about it. This is a magical one. I'm telling you. Okay? I'm going to throw this out there, and if you got any questions for me, the wonders, who, what, why stuff I said, I'm open to it. Got a few more little moments together. At yes. the end of the book, don't they leave the reservation? They don't go back home, so it seems like they just keep on going. Yep. Their family. So how I read that, how I grew up, was when when this is the reservation sectionality. That's the reservation, that's the outside. The resiliency in this kid is such that this is all Indian country, man. And he's going to go be making the story out there, and it doesn't matter if it's a reservation or not. I'm out. I'm going. I'm making my life. This is all Indian country. There's no sectionality for him. There's no, this is the reservation, this is the beginning or the end. There's just life. And he came to that resilient moment. That's a very different cultural read. It doesn't make me brighter. It just means from my culture and Louise's culture, it's a different story that we see. It's all Indian country. And it's all available to us. And there's no borders. Eliminating sectionality. Eliminating the borders. He's out. And there's no borders. Amazing way to, way to be in that book. Good question. Anybody else? Yes. Um, as you were talking, uh, we had an incident back on Bad River about six months ago. And it, you can almost take that incident and put it into that book where a uh, 14-year-old, uh, Amy J, was uh, shot by a National County police officer. Right. Uh, there was 14 people at the site of the shooting. And within two weeks, they wrapped up the investigation, and not one of the 14 people were interviewed. And they did an in-house Ashton County uh, investigation because uh, uh, there was literally five or six different jur jurisdictions that could have. Mm. Investigated and figured stuff out, all things that'll. What, what he's talking about for our audience at home and on film is that in the Bad River Reservation, the point was that this book is not a work of fiction, that this reality is happening for us almost on the daily. 
Uh, it's like Black Lives Matters, let's compare it to that. So when we have a shooting at a high school, remembering that for young black folks, death, when parents are sending their kids to school, they're not quite sure if they're coming back. Where a lot of us, I include me, I didn't ever have that question, that, are my kids coming back safe or not? Point is, what's happened in this book for a 13-year-old happened for a 14-year-old on the Bad River Reservation and other four-year-olds. Bad River Reservation is in northern third of Wisconsin, actually up to the very top, Lake Superior. And uh, the young people lost a friend. And what had happened, and I'm not going to go into great detail, but uh, this young fellow was uh, staying at home, and the police, uh, to, to kind of paraphrase what they're saying, is this young guy came at a police officer, and the police officer shot him to death, right? So the point that he was sharing is there are 14 people that were seeing this, and none of them were interviewed. The evidence seen where, was a place where different jurisdictions felt that they had jurisdiction, and so they kept going after each other to see who has jurisdiction for investigation to see if there's any prosecution that has to happen. And all the while, this kid's still dead and his friends are still mourning. So I know a little bit about that story because the young people that are his friends asked me to come and talk at their school. They asked American Indian Movement to come up. They asked someone to walk with them from the Bad River Reservation and go into the city of Ashland from where the sheriff's office is, the shooter. And when they did this march from the Bad River, River Reservation into this Ashland community, the Ashland community was having their Christmas parade. So you had one group coming this way, and you had one group coming this way. I was a little sweaty. <laughs> but the kids acquitted themselves, acquitted themselves well because Instead of going to our book and saying, because we're adults, we're going to run this for you guys, we told the kids, this is up to you. Whatever you guys want to do, and, and we're going to support you guys. Because at 13, 14, this was your friend. This is your drum brother who's saying, I'm going to drum with you guys at the school. This is your best friend. This is your buddy. This is a guy they call the teddy bear, like a kind of a boy in a man's body. 13, he's a big guy, but he's real, real kind of friendly and kind of ah, one of those kind of guys. He's a singer. A lot of those guys, growing up with them. And so now as adults, when we see these young kids, we know what's going to happen to these kids as they go through school, just like this guy's friend. He's got friends there. How are you feeling? And they're going to be having challenges throughout their school year now. Because what happened to them happened at 13 and 14, and there's going to be those things cropping up at 15, at 16, at 17, at 18 until they get to a certain point where they can kind of get a handle on it of experiences and adult kind of looking back at it. Do we learn for it or do we react from it? Right now they're in that quasi area developmentally. So we have to watch out for them. There wasn't just one victim at that crime scene. There was a victim of an entire community and those young faces that uh, um, we talked to. I think of that because I think of my own background. I grew up with that stuff. Louis Erdick, just a little bit older than me, grew up the same way, reservation. Not unusual in our communities. Older guy go out, freeze to death. Oh, it was accidental. No, it wasn't. But that's what we'd say, fool ourselves. Guy lay down on the tracks. Accidental. We knew better. Guy killed in a bar, killed by his own brothers. Accidental. They were drunk. No. Grow up with all that stuff all around you. So you think you, you develop a shell. And a book like this cracks that wide open. That's why it spoke to me. That's why I was happy to be asked to talk about it. So it's happening today. It's out there. If you get a sense of it, it's a good book to have a sense of it without having the guilt of, wow, man, this is a real person right here. There's plenty of real people it's happening to. You can get involved that way. But but through this book, it's a great introduction to it. It's a, more than an introduction. It will immerse you.